our grand rounds this morning is regional anesthesia and the future of orthopedic perioperative care. And uh, I want to thank uh, Neil for a lot of effort in uh, putting this uh, together and also our guest speakers. And so we have uh, Dr. Dunbar from Harborview, who I think all of us uh, know. And uh, he's going to wrap things up at the end. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Margaret or Greta Hockett, who is an anesthesiologist now at the VA. And we feel fortunate uh, to have her, have her uh, there. And she's going to open up the grand rounds by just reviewing uh, the literature and uh, kind of giving us a perspective on uh, regional uh, and perioperative pain management. And then we have Zach Fisk, who's going to be in the middle. And Zach is the director of regional anesthesia uh, at the VA. And I've come to know Zach uh, pretty well since he's been there. And uh, again, speaking for Albert and myself, uh, we feel that uh, he really is a, a, a addition uh, to our practice there. He's efficient and uh, excellent uh, with his blocks. And so I know most of you here don't get to work with Greta and Zach. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Neil Tarabatka. Are you going to, oh, you're going to go, you're, you're not doing anything. Yeah. All right. So I'll introduce Greta Hockett then. That was a very clever way to organize that one. <laughs> Hello. So um, I'm specifically going to be talking about uh, regional anesthesia and the improvement of patient outcomes and how we can help you in your practice. So a lot of people um, still don't know what regional anesthesia actually encompasses. So it can mean a spinal, an epidural, a combined spinal epidural, um, all the upper extremity nerve blocks, all the lower extremity nerve blocks, and then truncal nerve blocks, which um, you guys don't really need us for truncal nerve blocks unless um, it's something like an uh, intercostal nerve block for rib fractures if you're at Harborview. Um, and these may be single shots or have an indwelling catheter. So uh, what is the basis of regional anesthesia? So local anesthetics prevent or relieve pain by interrupting the nerve conduction. They bind to specific receptor sites on the sodium channels and the nerves, and they block the movement of ions through these pores. So by us placing um, local anesthetic near a spinal nerve or near a peripheral nerve, we can block signaling and prevent pain. So there's many advantages um, physiologically to having a neuroblockade of the afferent signal. So you can have improved tissue perfusion, which has been proven, and that really can help uh, your patients um, after surgery have some uh, improved healing. Um, optimal pain relief an attenuated pro-inflammatory response. We can stop the pain process before it even happens. Um, and an attenuated endocrine stress response, which also can help with healing. Uh, so I'm just going to lightly touch on this today. I can come back and talk much more in depth at this because of my experience at Virginia Mason with fast-track surgery. It's an interest of mine. Um, but essentially, the entire limb can be efficiently anesthetized with significant short-term benefits for the fast-track pathway, which is really the future of uh, perioperative care. Um, so decreased time to home readiness, decreased visual analog scale pain scores, decreased opioid consumption, uh, decreased time to ambulation, decrease, uh, improved satisfaction, and decreased nausea and vomiting. Um, in addition, continuous peripheral nerve blocks have been shown to decrease the time to meet three specific discharge criteria after both total knee and total hip arthroplasty. And those are adequate analgesia, independence from IV opioids, and sufficient ambulation. So um, I'm going to begin some of my uh, literature um, review. Um, so uh, as far as hip replacement and knee replacement goes, um, a recent meta-analysis of 21 randomized control trials um, was performed to evaluate the relative e efficacy of regional and general anesthesia in patients undergoing these uh, total joint arthroplasties. So pooled results from these trials show that regional anesthesia, meaning either spinal or epidural or combined spinal epidural, um, decrease the operating room time, uh, decrease the need for transfusion, uh, decrease the incidence of thromboembolic disease, and uh, decrease the incidence of pulmonary embolism. And then utilizing data from the UK collected between 2003 and 2011, um, there's a retrospective analysis of 90-day mortality and total hip replacements, and they identified four major modifiable clinical factors for an improved outcome. And you all probably already know of this, but 
That would be a posterior surgical approach, mechanical and chemical thromboembolic prophylaxis, and spinal anesthesia. So I know sometimes um, there can be a resident performing the spinal. Oftentimes there is, and maybe they're a little slow at it. But I know we want to get things going in the morning or in the afternoon. But really, if you know, you can just r be reminded of this study that spinal really will improve outcome. Then we can all um, work together and improve uh, patient outcomes. So a total of 513 patients were identified um, who underwent bilateral total knee replacement. 54% were performed under general and 45% uh, were performed under regional with a combined spinal epidural. Uh, regional was associated with significantly less perioperative blood loss and also 30-day complications. Uh, systemic and organ-specific infections were particularly lower in the uh, regional anesthesia group. And um, regional offered a 92 milliliter reduction in blood loss and 49% less overall complications compared to general anesthesia. So again, it speaks towards um, avoiding general for um, a, even a long surgery like a bilateral total knee replacement. <clears throat> so I know interscaling nerve blocks can be quite controversial for some. Um, so as compared to a general anesthesia alone um, in a randomized control trial with 50 patients, patients who received intrascaling nerve block versus general anesthesia uh, bypassed the PACU more frequently, so 76% versus 16%. Uh, they reported less pain, they ambulated earlier, they were ready for home discharge sooner, so at 123 minutes versus 286 minutes. They had no unplanned hospital admissions versus 25 patients who underwent the general anesthesia. Um, uh, they were more satisfied with their care, and no complications were reported in either treatment group. I know this is a small study, but it is just one of them. Um, so this was very interesting to me. When I was doing the literature review, I learned quite a bit, and this was one of the things that I learned. So um, a retrospective propensity match cohort study of COPD patients um, yielded almost 3,000 patients who received regional anesthesia, and about the same amount um, were matched uh, who received general anesthesia. And these groups were compared for morbidity and mortality. So compared with matched patients who received regional anesthesia, patients who received general had a higher incidence of postoperative pneumonia, prolonged ventilator dependence, increased unplanned postoperative intubation. Uh, composite morbidity was 15.4% in the general group versus 12.6% in the regional group. And composite morbidity, not including pulmonary complications, was 13% in the general versus 11% in the regional. And then 30-day mortality was similar. And I'd like to add that in this um, study, regional meant everything from peripheral nerve blocks to um, spinal and epidural. So many of you are familiar with the femoral nerve block for total knee replacement. I personally am doing adductor canal catheters, which is a um, just to describe the difference, it's... Um, a uh, branch of the femoral nerve um, and it uh, has motor sparing and it's been shown in many studies to have motor sparing. But um, I chose this because it was a very huge study and there's not as large of a study mass on adductor canal catheters. So a 2014 Cochrane review um, following total knee replacement, a femoral nerve block with or without concurrent treatments including PCA uh, provided more effective analgesia than PCA opioid alone. Um, and it was similar analgesia to epidural analgesia and had less nausea and vomiting compared to the other two modalities. Um, the review also found that continuous femoral nerve blockade provided better analgesia compared with single shot femoral nerve blockade. So uh, regional anesthesia improves outcome in trauma patients. Um, so specifically for those of you at Harborview or when you rotate at Harborview, um, this can be very important. Um, so it's uh, been shown that there's a widespread undertreatment of pain in trauma patients as you I'm sure are all aware. Um, so 60% of multiple injured patients with an injury severity score greater than 16 have an extremity injury, and 30% have two or more extremity injuries. So 20% uh, of these have multiple injuries with both upper and lower extremity injuries. Therefore, these injuries are very well suited to uh, regional anesthesia. So specific populations that have shown benefits, including morbidity and mortality advantages uh, with regional anesthesia, um, are those with fractured ribs, fractured femurs, fractured hips, and patients undergoing digital replantation. And I'm not sure how much uh, digital <coughs> replantation surgeries you all perform or if that's a plastics thing, um, but that can help for that as well. An interscaling block for shoulder reduction has been shown to reduce length of stay in the ER and the requirement for one-to-one -one monitoring. 
So for rib fractures, um, several studies have evaluated the effect of a thoracic epidural on outcomes. So um, 46 patients were randomized uh, with three or more rib fractures to receive either epidural or bupivacaine or IV opioid therapy. So despite a higher severity of pulmonary injury in those who got epidural, the incidence of pneumonia was significantly higher in the opioid group, so 38% versus 18%. And when adjusted for the presence of direct pulmonary injury, the relative risk of pneumonia in the opioid group was six-fold higher. Um, and randomization to epidural analgesia decreased the number of days requiring me mechanical ventilation by half, and epidural also reduced the pain associated with coughing or deep breathing compared with IV opioids or intrapleural anesthesia. So um, if you all are primary on a patient who has rib fractures, but um, you're um, wondering what to do for that, you can just uh, consult us and we can place an epidural for your patient. So obviously we all deal with hip fractures every day. So a systematic review of 83 studies uh, addressing various analgesic options for hip fractures, um, including systemic analgesia, traction, multimodal pain management, and neurostimulation. Um, only peripheral nerve blocks were found to be effective at reducing acute pain and delirium. Um, a Cochrane collaboration review of nerve blocks in patients with hip fractures concluded that femoral nerve block resulted in significant reductions in both pain intensity and opioid requirements, both preoperatively and during surgery. So, hope, so the idea is that when the patient arrives to the ER, the ER can consult anesthesia and we can come and place a femoral nerve catheter for these patients and they can be um, feeling much better and uh, the elderly, it's not good to have so much opioids. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, Peterson et al. introduced a care pathway for hip fracture that replaced parenteral opioids with a continuous femoral nerve block in a retrospective cohort study. Um, so the nerve block group had a significantly reduced incidence of in-hospital complications, as well as significantly reduced rates of confusion and uh, pneumonia. So these patients are, you know, 80, 90, even 100 years old. So obviously um, they're at great risk of um, delirium and confusion. Mortality was also decreased from 23% to 12% in community dwelling patients, but he did not see this in those who were um, in a nursing home. So delirium is a well-known independent risk factor for death, institutionalization, and dementia after hip fracture. Two factors that are known to substantially increase the likelihoods of delirium are moderate to severe pain and opioids, both of which can be minimized with a regional technique. So um, there was a study that stratified hip fracture patients for delirium on admission, and they investigated the effect of daily fascia iliaca block on delirium in intermediate and high-risk patients. Uh, no difference was seen between high-risk patients who received the block with pivocaine versus a sham block. However, those who were kind of borderline intermediate risk patients, they were significantly less likely to become delirious in the fascia iliaca block group, so only 2% of them became delirious versus the sham block where 17% of them became delirious. Um, as far as digital reimplantation goes, so uh, this was something else I learned in my uh, literature review. So um, success following the replantation of amputated digits um, depends on the grafted digit receiving an optimal blood supply while preventing vasospasm and thrombosis. Um, so um, when a continuous nerve block was placed in the upper extremity, uh, acral systolic blood pressure and flow were improved, and uh, the muscle relaxation associated with the nerve block helped to prevent inadvertent movement-related mishaps uh, during the delicate surgery. Um, and these patients were randomized to continuous supraclavicular block versus parenteral opioids uh, for digital transfer and or replantation. And they actually found that reoperation rates due to vascular insufficiency were 0% in those who received the supraclavicular continuous nerve block versus 29% in those who did not. So um, I've heard this a lot, you know, in my residency and fellowship and um, since being an attending, the fear of compartment syndrome and it's a very valid concern. Um, so. Acute compartment syndrome has traditionally um, been diagnosed on the basis of pain out of proportion to the injury. Um, and many clinicians will avoid regional techniques for fear that the neural blockade may mask the developing uh, acute compartment syndrome. However, these clinical signs and symptoms appear to only have a sensitivity and positive predictive value of 11% to 19%, while the specificity and negative predictive value are 97% to 98% for lower leg injuries. So. What's interesting is the classical clinical findings are more likely to be present in an injured patient without uh, compartment syndrome than in a patient with the syndrome. So while the absence of clinical signs and symptoms appears to be a reassuring sign, it is unlikely that a patient who has a sufficiently serious injury to be at risk for compartment syndrome would be free of pain, therefore calling into utility the um, 
of the high negative predictive value. So um, last, I believe this is my last slide, yes. Um, so fortunately, complications of nerve blocks are rare. Yes, there are complications, but um, we feel the benefits uh, outweigh the risks. So um, the best study that I found um, uh, looked at um, the incidence of neurologic symptoms lasting longer than five days, and they found an incidence of 0.9 per 1,000 blocks uh, over, I believe, an eight-year period um, having uh, neurologic symptoms lasting longer than five days. Then out of those patients, they looked at them at six months, and only 0.08 per 1,000 blocks um, still had symptoms lasting longer than six months. So it's very, very low. Um, and then localized infection, um, the incidence is anywhere from zero to three per 1,000. And those are more so associated with catheters, but they're extraordinarily rare. Um, local anesthetic systemic toxicity has an incidence of 0.08 per 1,000, again, extremely rare. And spinal hematoma, one in 220,000, it's classically cited, although that number's likely much less now that we have very good guidelines for um, uh, anticoagulation uh, in spinal timing. And uh, epidural hematoma, one in 150,000 cases. Again, that number should be downtrending now, now that we have uh, better data. And um, epidural abscess, um, 0.2 to 2.8 per 10,000 epidurals, so quite low. Okay. Zach? Thank you, Greta. That was actually really... Um, concise and excellent uh, discussion of um, benefits and complications. What I want to discuss with you is entirely different, and that is um, sort of the managerial side of acute pain service management. Having, having been um, the director of the APS uh, at the VA for about a year now, I've um, come to appreciate the managerial complexity. When I was at fellowship, people told me that it's hundreds of hours of unappreciated time. And uh, only after this year have I begun to realize that they were actually correct. Um, but nonetheless, it's very rewarding. Um, and as you notice uh, in my name, you'll see MBA. So I, I actually have an interest in systems management, <laughs> operational efficiency. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to just uh, address off the bat is wh when we should do the block. Should we do it awake versus asleep? Um, uh, they're always done asleep in pediatrics, essentially. And the reliability of pain and paresthesias when we're doing the nerve block has been shown to be very poor. Uh, so this, the brief conclusion that I will make here that it, you can do them asleep safely. So then, now that we know that we can do them asleep safely, when should we do them? Should we do them preoperatively, uh, right after the surgery, postoperatively in the PACU? And in order to address the answer to that question, it's important to take a step back and look at the mindset of a uh, pain service. Um, the overall gist of what we do um, is to make sure that we cause no harm, essentially. So safety is my number one priority when I manage um, the pain service at the VA. I want people um, to uh, that do the blocks to have an expertise in what they're doing and to make sure that, first and foremost, they don't cause neural injury or any other even more serious injury than that, such as pneumothoraces in the case of paravertebrals um, or uh, spinal hematomas, etc. Beyond that, um, we come down to quality versus efficiency, and unfortunately, those two are often uh, diametrically opposed to one another. Um, and so the question is, which should we uh, prioritize as a leader and as a provider? As a leader, of the group, I prioritize efficiency above quality, um, which is a, a sometimes unexpected stance for somebody who loves regional to take. But my goal is to get patients into the operating room on time and to make sure turnovers are minimized. And then uh, my secondary goal is quality. And, and the only way that I can maximize both of those is to make sure that on my pain service, I have people that can operate or that can perform procedures quickly and well. Um, and for that reason, we've hired Greta. We have a loan in our group who, who's an expert in regional anesthesia. Um, and we have Piotr, who loves efficiency above everything else, if you've ever met him. Um, unfortunately, uh, sometimes it's hard for the leaders of acute pain service to make that happen because 
will, I, I, for example, just yesterday I went up to a, uh, one of my uh, people who wanted, who, uh, one of my attendings who's actually non-regional attending, um, and I said, can we just do this block afterwards? And they were uh, adamant that the block must be done before the procedure, and because of that, um, we were late to the OR by half an hour, which is entirely unacceptable. Um, and just taking a brief and a aside about that, people often ask me, um, well, you know, I'm going to do what's right for the patient. I don't care if we're going to be a few minutes late to the OR. It's, it's entirely unfair. The, sometimes the surgeons take three hours to close, or they let their, their medical students close. What, how is that fair? And, and my response to them is, well, life is unfair. Surgeons um, are the ones that allow us to do these blocks. If we keep delaying their case, they're just going to say, no more blocks. Um, and as the, a leader, I have to take the stance that if, uh, efficiency um, comes first. And then uh, if, if they still require more uh, explanation, then I go on to tell them that um, uh, lateness is not uh, an issue in so much that it delays a, a, um, a day. Maybe we'll make the day end half an hour later at worst. But it creates extreme anxiety. Our personalities, especially in the surgical setting, are, are such that uh, tardiness is considered extremely um, uh, unprofessional and disrespectful. And therefore, tightness is uh, entirely unacceptable, and I try to minimize that as much as I can. Nonetheless, sometimes it's difficult, and, um, and I, I, I'm, that's a constant struggle that I have with the people that, I'm, that I lead. Um, the purpose of our service is threefold. We need to satisfy patients, and Greta talked substantially about how we can do that. Um, we need to satisfy surgeons, which is, is challenging, but possible. We can actually, when we're not irritating you guys, we can actually uh, make you happy if, we're, if, we, um, if we do our job correctly. And finally, we go into this field because we love it, um, but we need to be aware um, that it's not just love for the field that, that, um, that, that makes us happy. We actually need to look out for ourselves a little bit. So we're trying to maximize all three of those, uh, uh, th those um, stakeholders within the, uh, the setting that we operate. So for, in order to, to minimize um, your dissatisfaction, we need to avoid delays, and I've already talked about why that is. That includes first cases, turnovers, discharges. We often take over, at least my service takes over the pain phone calls at night, which can uh, substantially reduce the burden uh, upon interns or surgical residents um, in an academic setting. Uh, so that's something that we can do to help you. Um, another thing that's important to prevent irritation is to for everybody to understand what's expected. So I've never seen a surgeon happy when they walk into a, uh, into the pre-op setting and say, to say hi to their new patient and we're doing an entirely different block um, than what they were expecting or a new block that they've never seen before. You know, it's, oh yeah, we're doing a, a quadratus femoris uh, field block. And, oh, I've never seen them. Like, Wonderful. You know, they're usually quite, oh, they, they give me a very surprised look and um, are expecting the worst. So it's important that we um, make sure we communicate often with the surgeons and know, so they know exactly um, what, what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then there's ir little irritations that um, we can avoid, like taping in their field, um, uh, as an example. Um, in terms of our satisfaction, this is something that's actually often overlooked, um, but it's, uh, it's important that, we that, I, that I run a service that makes the people that um, I employ happy as well. So I need to make sure that the hours are reasonable. For my providers, I need to make sure that even though I have standardized protocols and nerve blocks that I expect them to follow, that they also feel that they can deviate to some degree from those protocols in order to um, practice medicine, because medicine is not all about protocols. Um, it's about being able to uh, practice what you consider to be the best, the best care for your patient. Um, and uh, from a leadership standpoint, my job satisfaction comes from um, uh, making sure that my systems that I've put in place are working efficiently and that the, as few people yell at me each day as possible. Um, so for me, uh, when I consider pre versus post-operative um, nerve blocks, uh, my service, um, I try to make all of my blocks pre-op and I'll tell you why, as I know that's different than the way the University of Washington system works. Um, for one thing, the, um, we don't have to be there from 6.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night and I think morale within my service is very important. But uh, there's, there's um, many less self-serving reasons that preoperative blocks are important. Um, first of all, it's much easier to position the patient, much easier to actually do the block effectively when um, dressings aren't in the way, when patients aren't writhing in pain. It's safer. 
It minimizes costs because we not only reduce opioids that we need to use, but we also reduce personnel costs because often many more personnel are needed for a sedated um, or intubated or otherwise writhing in pain patient than, than we need in a preoperative comfortable patient. Um, it ensures the patients are properly consented because oftentimes after a surgery, I ask patients in a ton of pain, did you do a, a consent? Well, not really. And then they're screaming, now what do I do? Um, as I said, it reduces opioids and minimizes patient suffering. Patients generally come out of the PACU much more comfortable if they've had a nerve block beforehand. Postoperatively, the advantage is it's much less stressful um, from, from my standpoint if I don't have to worry about getting people back to the OR on time. But I think that um, that, that lack of stress does not outweigh the benefits of pre-op blocks. And it's also sometimes reassuring if you do a block afterwards and it actually works that, um, uh, uh, that what you're doing it makes a difference. And actually that can be reassuring to patients as well when they feel the difference between extreme pain and mild to moderate pain before and after the block. So there are, there, and you know, I try to make most of my blocks pre-op, but for example, yesterday when we got out of our meeting at 7.25 or 7.20 and um, uh, it, it, doing the nerve, the two catheters that we wanted to place would have delayed the case by half an hour. To me then, okay, in that case, let's just do the block post-op. We can still do a, a, a reasonable job for this patient. But as a general mindset, I like to try to make my, bro my blocks pre-op. So to make pre-op blocks happen, there's a few things that need to occur. The patients need to arrive early, um, as, as we do. So I had a director at the University of Pittsburgh. His name is Dr. Shelley. He was a very cantankerous French guy. And um, he, he would tell us, if you do not want to arrive at 5.30, then there is a flight out of Pittsburgh today. And we can find you another position elsewhere. And that's kind of his position on everything um, that we did. Uh, <laughs> when it was uh, against protocols that he had developed. But nonetheless, it is important that we arrive early, that we're some of the first people in the hospital. It's difficult to do with the VA um, because it's hard to get salaried um, VA employees to check in patients early. Um, after the, so, and I think that APS and regional both should be available to do blocks. So we maximize personnel available to do first case blocks. Um, that's hard to do at VA also, and therefore our system is to allow the operative, the room, the, the um, and anesthesia providers in the actual operating room to do the most of the first case blocks, which is a uh, it's a compromise that I have to make because we don't just don't have enough personnel to um, to achieve first case blocks done by the regional service. Um, uh, the other thing that we need to do is, as I said, align the the my mentality of efficiency above um, all else with the provider's mentality who oftentimes is do the best for this particular patient. I need to be considerate of all the patients down the line and I need to try, I try my best to make my, the people that I work with see it that way as well. And then in order to prevent irritation after first, part, first case blocks, we need to make sure we tape properly to make sure, to reassure um, the, the room that even if our tape is underneath the, the, the tourniquet, for example, that it's okay. And if there is a concern for compartment syndrome um, or some other neural check is desired afterwards, then we can put in saline catheters beforehand uh, where we don't um, anesthetize the nerve at all, but are ready to provide a bolus right afterwards rather than having to do the block afterwards. Um, it's important that we protocolize and um, automize as much as possible every aspect of the, the anesthetic. So expected blocks for expected procedures um, or expected range of blocks for certain procedures, for example, total knees and total hips. Um, and that multimodal analgesia, which has been shown um, to be effective, is an acceptable practice. Um, that when patients develop problems after the surgery, that the regional service has a, as an, a, a protocolized way of dealing with those problems, like catheter leaks, what do we do? Patients in pain, who, who's called, what do we do? Um, that when the, catheters, when, when the catheters should come out, um, should be protocolized as well. So we have all of our catheters stop on post-op day. All of our, for example, all of our femoral catheters are, or adductor canal catheters are stopped on post-op day two in the morning at 6 a.m. Um, expected transitions to the chronic pain regimen should be smooth. Um, and we have to maintain our core values, meaning uh, my service, I, 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 there's a few things that I require in my service in order to, to provide uh, uh, effective pain service. I need to be allowed to do blocks, and I like to have the mentality that if possible, I can do the blocks beforehand. And, you know, for example, if a sur surgical service came up to me and said, can you just do PCA management? I'd say, no, I'm not going to just do PCA management. I need to be able to uh, do procedures, and I, I like to be able to do them beforehand. And if, if that's impossible, then it's just, we just, I feel we need to maintain those core values 
um, even if it irritates or uh, angers certain people. Um, the, the problem with protocolization is you need to allow people, as I said before, to be creative, to practice medicine. And in order to introduce new blocks, for example, there needs to be a dedicated QI process, which we're establishing right now at the VA. And communication is key. We need to communicate constantly with the nurses who need to be trained and retrained frequently, physical therapy in the case of orthopedics, and as well as the surgeons. Um, finally, the blocks need to be stopped at a certain hour. Uh, 3 or 4 p.m., the blocks become very rare. Um, and that's possible only if you do preoperative blocks. But as I said, I think that that's important um, in order to maintain morale within my service. Um, this is an acute pain service. I think that acute pain and chronic pain services should be separate services. Chronic pain deals with a lot of issues that acute pain doesn't deal with, like cognitive behavioral therapy, social work, medication planning, et cetera. And I don't feel that um, the acute pain providers are adequately equipped to deal with a lot of chronic pain issues when they, chronic, when they enter their chronic phase, which usually occurs three or four days after their operation. Therefore, a dedicated chronic pain service should be in place to take over management of those patients. So briefly, which blocks should be done? So for um, uh, surgical anesthesia, epidurals are wonderful, but I believe that for post-operative pain control, um, peripheral nerve catheters are, are the way uh, to go with more, most orthopedic procedures. And the reason that I say that is because epidurals after a surgery, for example, if you do an epidural after a knee patient uh, or a hip procedure, will cause a uh, leg weakness very often. In the case of a, a, a hip surgery, it can often cause hypotension. Um, there's always a, a concern for epidural hematomas with anticoagulation. Anticoagulation in peripheral nerve catheters is much less of an issue. Um, the epidurals are frequently stopped, blamed for everything. Recently, we had an example where they were blaming it on a, a high heart rate on the epidural, a fever on the epidural, and therefore the patient didn't get an adequate workup otherwise. So I feel like an epidural, uh, for post-operative management, um, is detrimental compared to a peripheral nerve catheter, but, but for surgical anesthesia, it's, it's still a very reasonable technique. Um, we, I prioritize uh, motor sparing in my block. So we do it after canal catheters for, for knees often, or if we do ephemeral, then I have a protocol, protocol set up so that we run the ephemeral at a very low concentration, very low rate. So, and we test the, the, I communicate with physical therapy on a daily basis to make sure that those patients who have the ephemeral block still have adequate motor function for physical therapy. Um, I do the same for hips, whether I do ephemeral, fasciliac, or lumbar plexus, which is my preference. Um, for upper extremities, um, we tend to rely on brachial plexus blocks, of course, and our understanding of brachial, brachial, the brachial plexus has to be quite profound in order to provide adequate analgesia for those um, the upper extremity blocks. These are generally most of the areas that we cover in the, in the, when we do um, nerve blocks for orthopedic surgery. Um, we can block the brachial plexus right here, we can block it right here, we can block it right here, we can block it down here. And we actually have very specific understanding of all of the different nerves that come off of these uh, various locations of the uh, roots, trunks, divisions, uh, cords, or uh, peripheral nerves so that we know exactly what we're blocking. Uh, we can, like, as Greta mentioned before, we can do a saphenous block down here, we can do a femoral block up here, uh, we can do obturator blocks, we can do lateral femoral cutaneous blocks. Um, and our decision to whether or not we do that is based on our understanding of how patients react to those procedures after the surgery. With respect to the sciatic block, we can block the, the sciatic nerve in this region, which is actually the sacral plexus block and covers not only sciatic nerve, but also S1 um, branches such as the superior um, gluteal nerve and the nerve to quadratus femoris, which can provide total analgesia for the hip if you combine that with the lumbar plexus block. We can do the sciatic block here through the periformis, we can do it here, which is called the subgluteal approach, and we can do it down lower in the popliteal region. We can also do lumbar plex plexus approaches, as I mentioned, where we go from the back. Those are the major blocks that we use for orthopedic procedures, um, just to cover that. Uh, so compromise that my service has had to make, um, as I said, that we, uh, this, that's the ideal setup that I just mentioned to you. Compromise my service has had to make, we, I have to allow um, the uh, non-regional uh, experts to do the regional procedures. Um, I, uh, I, uh, that's, that's really, and occasionally they, we have to deviate from protocols, like allowing a block to be done post-operatively, for example. Um, at the UW, they made a lot of compromises with respect to their service as well. The residents are Q2, which um, can't be good for morale. Um, they get a lot of phone calls late at night, um, so there's lack of protocolization from the nurse's standpoint, lack of education from the nurse's standpoint, probably um, uh, makes it very difficult um, at night for, for, 
for, for them. There's a lot of late days there because probably because a large largely because a lot of those blocks are done post-operatively, uh, which is a conjecture on my part. They have bad weekends, a lot of chronic pain patients. There's not a separate chronic pain and acute pain service. They're all combined into one. And I feel that that's a compromise that they've had to make as well. Um, so there's a there's a disparity, of course, between what I consider to be the ideal setup and what can actually be done. But uh, overall, that's the mentality that I have as a, as a acute pain service leader, and I hope that elucidates for you all um, what it is that I'm after and what leaders of an acute pain service are after when we, um, when we manage our, these patients for you. Thank you, Mark. Zach, this sounds like he's got things well organized. The question is, can I manage to get this clicker to work? Uh, yes. Um, I want to present to you that you've, uh, you've all heard about the changes that are taking place in reimbursement, and Dr. Chansky was particular seemed to have an interest as the chairman. That somehow is not surprising. Um, our regional anesthetics are relic of the fever service past. Well, let's go into the, this issue here. Um, the, uh, let me make the laser work. Uh, there, yeah. Uh, the question is, why are, why are they even looking at bundled payments? We all know that uh, healthcare expenditures are, are rising high, and as people who are in the healthcare industry, we should look at this as a great thing because our business is increasing. However, the people that are paying the bills are not so excited about it. And so this paper is the Hussey paper from uh, New England Journal in 2009. And of all the things that are going to reduce the cost of healthcare, bundling is the one that seems to have the biggest impact. These other impacts, like you know, just having folks who aren't doctors doing, surgery, doing anesthesia or, or uh, primary care, um, is, doesn't make much of a difference. The medical home thing that we've all heard about doesn't make much difference. Disease management, plus minus. But bundles, there seems to be no doubt. Even in the worst case scenario, bundling uh, is, is reducing cost. And so it comes as no surprise that our friend Sylvia Burwell, that's her in the middle, uh, she is the secretary of, uh, of CMS, she's in charge of Medicare. She says that our first goal is for 30% of all Medicare provider payments to be in alternative payment models that are tied to how well providers care for their patients instead of how much care they provide, and do it by 2016. That's next year, folks. Uh, which, in, when you actually get down to thinking about policy, is like yesterday. Um, I'm not satisfied with that. The goal is to get to 50% by 2018, and in addition to these goals, there's also measure, quality measurement goals, which are uh, are equally uh, arduous. So why is wh why, what do we do about this? Uh, well, not satisfied with the progress that's being seen, they decided let's pick on orthopedics. Great to be orthopedist, right? Uh, let's pick an orthopedics and say hips and knees are going to be bundled payments. When she's talking, she's talking about across the board all medical care. But uh, there was an announcement last year, which interestingly was announced in a notice and comment rulemaking process. It's not a law from the federal government. It's just through a rulemaking process, which can't be appealed, um, to support a new model of more efficient care for beneficiaries. So in 75 metropolitan statistical areas, including the Puget Sound area, um, they're going to do a comprehensive care joint, the CCJR, as it's called, for LEJRs. Um, and you can read all about it here. Uh, it's uh, essentially, and, and in case, lest you think that it's not going to apply to you because you're going to deal with private patients, wrong. Um, it's going to apply to you big time because the employers are already on board. That's what the ACO is all about. That jacked from somebody else's slide. Um, these are the DRG groups, uh, 0470s, which of course is what you guys care about, and a bunch of other things. But what I want you to look at in this slide is the black bar is what Medicare pays for the service. The colored bars are what it actually costs the organization to deliver the care. So this did not go well for this organization. There's the bill. That's what they got paid. That's what it cost. This one did great. That's what it cost, that's what we're paid. So let's move to 0470, which as you know is a total hip replacement. Um, is a notice the total hip replacement, you'll notice that the acute care episode and these color bars, this is the acute care episode in orange. That is what the money that is spent in the operating room 
in the hospital in that time while they're in the OR. The next thing that varies is the post-acute care episode, <coughs> is yellow, and then that's for the first 30 days. And you get out to orange, 61 days. If you go back the other slide there, this is a guy who obviously had a, had a bad post-op complication, but he's in the hospital. He's still spending money at 90 days. So in summary, the, 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 the ability to maintain viability of the facility of the hospital um, and the doctors, since we were bound together, um, really depends not so much on your acute care episode, but on preventing these long-term high cost episodes. In a nutshell, infection is probably the single biggest issue, or DVTs, or other major complications that occur, the, the, the cost for which accrue in the operating room, accrue outside the operating room. So cost variability is a big deal here. Um, the biggest cost overruns occur outside the care. So organizations are very keen to move, and organizations, I mean healthcare organizations, are keen to see, measure patients' care and outcomes. And there's this volume to value thing that you hear about. And um, payers want to see value for money, or they lose. This is another thing here, that payers, like regions, they want to see value for the money that they spend, or they lose the contract with Boeing. At least in this community, the, the employers are a very, very powerful driver of change. Um, which basically gets down to, they're, they're, in the case of a Boeing, it's about the population, is the po their population of patients. So why does this work, regional anesthesia? Well, better than I could articulate, my uh, other colleagues have pointed out that these are the areas which we can actually make a difference in regional anesthesia, reducing blood loss, early ambulation, reducing length of stay or morbidity, and improved HCAP scores. That's, you know, patient satisfaction scores. And I'm not going to reiterate that because it was done very well already. In a nutshell, the benefit of the blocks, reduce post-op care costs. Um, and the reduction of post-op care costs is reducing variability, which is reducing the overall cost of the bundle. Um, so I am fairly confident that, uh, that we, are, we are in a good position to say that regional anesthesia is a great thing for your patients and it's a great thing not just because we have a lot of fun putting needles in people but it, it's a great thing because it's going to reduce the long-term costs of care in the population of patients that you take care of but the key thing is we're all going to have to work together that this is really really a quite a case of, of, of working together as a team um, now, we have an inherent advantage at UW Medicine because we're all basically under the same paycheck. We all report to the same dean. You know, so working with the hospital, working with the, with the physician should be easier. But to be fair, I mean, I know it's hard for you. It doesn't have much competition because we, after all, cater to people by not asking for their money. But, you know, which is a tremendous advantage when you're trying to get volume, but not necessarily a great way to make money. Um, right now... We are, and this is the, the take home point that I'm going to give you. Um, we think, at least I've found that the surgical teams in, in, in the UW are, everyone is defending their little piece of turf thing. Well, I don't want to give a share of my fee to the anesthesiologist. I don't want to give a share of my fee to X, Y, and Z. What people are actually unaware of is the, the number of other actors that are in there. SNFs are a far, far bigger. Skilled nursing facilities are the, are the biggest driver of it nationally, are far and away the biggest driver of variability in total hip replacement cost. Nothing to do with anesthesia. It's all about post-op care. Um, but at the end of the day, physicians, that's you and I, we don't realize how many other people are getting a chunk of the pie, but basically all the decisions about care are made by physicians. And... Uh, that's us. So we'd love to work with you to improve the care of your patients and to be successful as a business. And that's it. Thank you very much. You guys want to come on? There will be uh, more questions, but, but thank you. That was great.
And again, I'll put in a uh, plug for uh, Zach, uh, who really has been a great addition for us at the VA. He's put his uh, principles into practice there. And uh, prior to him getting there, we didn't really have a reliable way to get fascia iliacus blocks, iliacus blocks or lumbar plexus blocks. And uh, now with Zach and Greta, we can get all of those adductor canal blocks. So it, it, we really have a great uh, regional pain service there. So I had a couple of uh, questions, and I'm sure there will be more to follow. Uh, my first one was, uh, what about spinals? Because now I work at several different hospitals, including Northwest, and, and in our system, we've always been told that it's too dangerous to get spinals done in the preoperative holding area. And, you know, that, like, one-minute time that it takes to transport somebody from, uh, from the block area uh, to the OR is is potentially dangerous, and yet, you know, we see it done differently at a different hospital, and uh, obviously they think it's safe, and it's, it's you know, a way to keep the day moving and get the blocks done, uh, you know, between cases, and so I was just uh, curious as to your thoughts on that, as we talk about standardization and, you know, trying to be more efficient. Um. So I can definitely speak to that. Currently um, at uh, the VA, we're not doing that, but um, Zach and I are starting to protocolize um, a plan for that. I know you guys will all be very happy about that when you come to the VA. So at the VA, um, my idea, though, is to have them on a portable monitor. No big deal. It won't take that much time. So you place the spinal, um, and immediately, you know, you, you walk them to, you push them to the OR, get them on the table, get monitors on, fully goes in right away. It actually... I believe doing a pre-op, uh, pre-induction, I'm sorry, in the induction room doing the spinal actually somehow makes everyone a little more um, motivated because you know there's a time limit on that spinal. You know, they're not forever. And so I think everyone gets into gear a little bit more. There's a little bit more of a fire lit under their feet, and I think it just makes the day go faster. So we're, we believe in that, and we're working on that. My my second question it's it's uh, maybe maybe a uh, philosophical question more than anything but but with bundled pricing in particular and some of these alternative payment models we're, we're all feeling enormous pressure to become more efficient and it's hard to envision how we're going to be able to continue uh, letting residents uh, be as involved uh, in our procedures as they've been in the past although you know that's one of our main missions and and short of you know the medical schools and the deans you know fighting some of these things at a national level uh w what kind of uh are you using any simulation uh training or other ways of uh making your residents more efficient at these blocks before they actually start placing them in patients yeah i, I can certainly address how we're we're trying to teach our residents. Um, we're not any way of making uh, making the most junior residents who do the blocks rarely quicker. Um, what we have done is we've established a, a intense two week regional rotation at Harborview and, and, a, and a, a similar one at the university, where we take a fourth year resident and have them do nothing but blocks for two weeks. At the end of that time, at least, and I've, and I've been training a lot of people like that for the last couple of years, the difference in the speed and productivity of the residents after that intense rotation is dramatic. It is, they are dramatically faster and more efficient because they, the sheer volume of blocks we do forces that to be the case. We don't really have an easy way of getting things speeded up in the process. Do you, you have a better answer than that? Not really, but I, I can say that for now that I have the service um, where I, we have a dedicated regional resident every month, um, at the beginning of that rotation, I will be very active in you know, putting monitors on uh, myself, um, getting the IV if they're not concentrating on that, positioning the patient, putting the towels on the patient, opening and stuff, as much as I can do, and then they can put the little needle in, but that's really um, actually a short amount of the total block time sometimes. Um, but it's a lot of the time that it takes them to get set up. Yes, and by the end of the rotation, they are then very familiar with how to set up properly, and I can be le less hands-on, although I will be still if they're being slow. There's still a real challenge. That is the big challenge for teaching facilities, is the ability to deal with it. I mean, good news on final payments, they're not going to come as soon as we think they are. 
Thank you. Any other questions? I thought it was a great session, and uh, <clears throat> especially since I was interested in looking at the efficiency at the University of Washington OR, and several years ago found out that we were really uh, about uh, uh, $50,000 is the total cost in the big picture of a one hour delay in the operating room. So with that driving force, I'm really interested in your thoughts. But one of them is many people say surgery is the only thing that should be done in the operating room. And that brings up the architectural design of the operating room and what influence you have had at the different institutions because I think that's really the key to getting pre pre anesthesia prior to being in the operating room. So about just about like how okay, I think I know what you're asking. Um Oh, yes. Um actually this is really interesting. So on a more general note, there is a difference um, between over and under utilization in terms of cost. By that I mean if you have an unexpectedly long case where you're suddenly paying people overtime or you have to do an add-on to a room that then has to go longer than expected, that costs two to three times as much as having a open free OR available to add cases onto even if those, that OR is generally less productive. Um, it's been, that, that's actually research that was done by um, a guy named Dr. Hudson at the uh, University of Pittsburgh, I worked with him quite a bit. And that, that over and under utilization difference um, contributes to how uh, operating, um, operating room suites and efficiency um, is maximized within at least that setting. And I've actually tried to introduce that concept into the VA, maybe having an open room, because we do have a lot of add-ons, but uh, there's just not enough ORs to accommodate that per, uh, compared to the number of surgical services that want to be in the OR at the same time. Uh, we know that uh, uh, epidurals have a very, uh, are very effective for the pain, but I would like uh, you to uh, discuss, if you would, about the effect of epidurals on motors. And I bring that up for very practical reasons. At, uh, there is some reluctance about uh, doing blocks in children. Uh, especially uh, because of their communication issues, and therefore we have this pushback. And um, the question arises when it happens and the child postoperatively is not moving toes, and they're in a cast. Those who say, and which there are many anesthesiologists at children, that epidurals have no effect on motors, then our action is to take the cast off. Those who say that epidurals do have effect on motors, we then uh, shut down the epidural. So since this comes up monthly at our complication conference, I would like to not discuss it at our complication conference anymore. <laughs> so could you tell me about the effect of epidurals on motors? Yes. So um, that is a wonderful, wonderful um, question. Um, I agree with you. Um, any, any epidural placed um, that affects uh, the nerves that control your legs, of course, it's going to cause muscle weakness. There's something called a walking epidural that they've done in OB at Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, and that is an extremely dilute epidural solution. It's got some opioid in it. Um, I, you know... As much as I love epidurals for surgeries, I think for any lower extremity surgery, that epidural should come out, um, you know, after the surgery. Um, if if it's a if it's a child, I mean, I don't work with kids, unfortunately, but if I were to put an epidural in a child, I would, you know, bolus the epidural, you know, at the end of the surgery and take it out, and then you wouldn't have to worry about compartment syndrome. I'm not really sure what the pushback is from taking it out. Um, there's other ways of providing analgesia to patients. Um, as far as adults go, um, one thing that um, I have done recently since coming to the VA a couple months ago is um, if it's a patient that um, is a real sick patient, had a hip fracture, and um, you know we, we don't want to have the patient delirious, um, we'll put an epidural in, and then we know that they need PT the next day, so we can shut off the epidural solution at 2 a.m. 
pull the epidural at 6 a.m. They're ready for their PT by that morning. So I think, you know, we can all, you know, work together on this to help epidurals not confuse the picture and not, you know, worry, make you worry about acute compartment syndrome. And epidurals, there's a difference between surgical anesthesia and analgesia, post-operative analgesia for epidurals. So if you run a very low concentration of pubic infusion, it's very unlikely to cause complete motor loss to the point that they can't move at all. But surgical anesthesia, if you if you really bolus it up, it's going to take a few hours for that to wear off. So I mean, post-op setting, they may not be able to move their legs. And that may be where you're experiencing the uh, dichotomy of opinions as to whether or not the epidural is really affecting the patient. So uh, something else to keep in mind. And uh, one comment and one more question. It, the Some of our competitors use a, we work in series, some of our competitors around the city use a parallel model where there's a block team doing every block, including spinals in the block room. There's a turnover team. So while the surgeon is out dictating, talking to the family of the patient they just operated on, the patient that's been blocked is being brought into the room without the surgeon's involvement being positioned, prepped, draped, basically ready to go. So, so as we you know move into this new era, there are other things that I think we can do to become much more efficient. But I had w one more question, and, and that is uh, some of my colleagues have become really interested in, in Expirel, which is, I think, liposomal encapsulated uh, bupivacaine that can last uh, supposedly 72 hours uh, after an injection. And it's not on the formulary at the U or at the VA, but at Northwest we've been uh, using it more and more. And, I think it's obviously debatable. It's a relatively new drug, but some of us have become convinced that it can actually take the place of regional uh, anesthesia. And so I was just curious as to your opinion on that. And any comments about the efficiency also? I actually wrote an article about that about a year ago it was in Anesthesiology News. Um, so I can speak can to you that. use the mic? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Is this close enough? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So I wrote an article about that about a, a year ago in Anesthesiology News, so I can speak to that. Um, the, the major advantage of Expirel can be achieved when um, it is done in the case of motor sparing. That's the first thing to, to note. Um, so, for example, intraarticular injections into the knee is generally going to be motor sparing, or uh, paravertebrals are going to be motor sparing. Saphenous blocks, maybe, um, if they're done low enough, can be motor sparing. But I think it's a high-risk procedure to do a block the last 72 hours in a case where the potential for um, complete motor block can cloud your picture as to whether or not the patient has a nerve injury or whether or not they can perform physical therapy well. So I think there's absolutely still a place for prolonged um, uh, catheter placement in, in many orthopedic procedures. Um, secondly, Expel, despite the fact that um, they, the uh, Pacira claims that it lasts 72 hours, um, the data just isn't there to support that claim, uh, especially if it's dilute. It costs right now $266 for 20 cc's. So it's um, extremely expensive. When I did a cost analysis to, to determine whether or not it should be uh, um, introduced into the VA system, um, it, it, there was substantially more cost with Expo than even a catheter-based approach. Um, nonetheless, um, there are certainly reductions in the amount of work that one needs to do. If you just do a single shot of Expirel, you don't have to worry about catheter leakage and all of those post-operative problems. So there may be a place for it, but I think consideration to motor sparing um, uh, blocks only and, um, and further studies to elucidate its true efficacy are needed. When I, I, on, on the topic of efficiency, when I started here, my hair looked a lot more like Zach's, okay? And every now and again, I get it into my head, I can speed up the turnover at Harborview. Luckily, it passes quite quickly. <laughs> you know, trying to get these things to work more efficiently, is a, is, it's, it's a goal. Um, but I, I think the architectural layout is a really interesting point. But I think it's a, it's a much deeper issue than, than, than anesthesia. I, I was in private practice many decades ago, and I reckon, you know, my turnover time, you know, from out of the room to into the room should be, you know, less than 10 minutes. Uh, and, you know, that, that there's, you can do that in, in, in certain circumstances, but you, the point is when, you, when every now and again I, 
I, I, like I said, I, I want to make Harvey go faster, so I take the patient back to the room when I'm ready. The last time I did it, it was room 11, and the cleaners had not finished cleaning the operating room table, let alone any nurses come in to set anything up. So as I said, it passed. But um, I'm very interested in making it go faster, but I, 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 I am at my wit's end as to how to make that happen. I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to do it. That has it. The way you have to make that happen is you make everybody in the operating room have to stay until the day is done. The problem is the surgeons have to stay until it's done. The yep. nurses don't, cleaners don't, and often the anesthesiologists don't. That's true. So if you tell anybody, everybody that works in the room, they, they don't go home until the day, then they'll speed up. Yeah, if, if they, you're absolutely right. I mean, if, if you see a reward from going quickly, then you're much more likely to do it. But, but all that's going to happen if you're rewarded by going quickly is that you're going to get put into another room. You know, it's, it's not that exciting to people. Or, as you said, you don't get to go home. But you're going to have a hard job with union labor on that one. <laughs> but you can have a go at it. <laughs> so one question, I have a sort of discussion, having worked with Harvey for 30 years, I can tell you that some of those things are continual. They don't change. But there, I hear in the community there are a lot of people that are now doing where they have a lower extremity procedure done and they go home with the, the catheters. I hear people doing colines that way, going home, not, not even admitted to the hospital. Where are we with that? Because I hear about it, I've heard about it for the last three years, but nothing's been happening. Uh, I can c certainly tell you what's happened or hasn't happened at Harborview. This has been on and on again, off again at Harborview for a few years. And we did have this, th we did get the infusion pumps that they're using at VM for a short while, but somehow the process never got set up. I mean, I, I'll, I'll bring it up again. I mean, it, but I don't know, I don't know about the university, but are you, are you going to do it at VA? So certainly for the extremely rare ASA1 and ASA2, which means low, very low risk patients, that's possible when we deal with chronic pain patients or patients with extreme amounts of comorbidity, which is often the case at the VA, that becomes a, a more of an issue, but, but probably for very particular patient populations. We are getting catheters at the VA. That's already been approved. We've gone through that process. And then they're just going to, at first, we're just going to probably introduce those to maybe um, total shoulders who want to go on post-op day one or total ankles for, for a similar procedure. And then we'll expand it, um, working with surgeons, physical therapy, et cetera, to, to other services. I mean, it's, it's entirely possible to instruct the patients, particularly your patients, Steve, you know, who are very well tuned in. You know, it's entirely possible to, to instruct them how to take a catheter right the next yeah. day. Oops, well, hold on one second. This is a question uh, from somebody at Haberview, Dr. Domes. Uh, how do they, f okay. It's, a, it's actually a, a fair question. We're running late, but I think that's actually a good sign. This has uh, been an engaging uh, presentation. So how do our anesthesiologists uh, follow their patients uh, post-hospitalization to find out whether they've had any block-related uh, complications that perhaps didn't show up while they were hospitalized? Um, so... At, so at the VA, I'm not so sure that patient population calls. They kind of tough things out, unfortunately. But um, one thing that I think would be a good idea is if we give them, you know, our um, general, you know, line, an office line or something where they can leave a message if um, there is something that, you know, we can kind of give a disclaimer and say, you know, if there is a problem five days, ten days out, please call this number and we'll get back with you. So that could be a way to follow up. When we establish our home catheter program, we're actually going to... Um partially perform a study where we follow patients in that two-week window between the time where they're discharged and when they see the surgeon, which is a sort of blank window where, that, where nobody owns the patient. We're going to start to um, see if there's any advantage to calling patients during that time frame. And that certainly doesn't address the issue of extremely long-term, six months to a year, persistent nerve injury. I, I haven't developed a way of, of figuring, of, of, of uh, following up and seeing if that is going to, if, if that happens, but at least in that short term, period we're, we're, we're planning on following up. 
So, certainly at Harborview, the, the nurses, when they do the post-op phone calls on all the patients, if they've had nerve blocks, they ask questions about the nerve block duration and any complications. All right. Well, th thank you. That was a great uh, presentation, and we appreciate your time and coming over here.